Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're going to be playing Order of Battle Pacific, a turn-based strategy slash war game by the Art Aristocrats. Uh, we're returning to the Battle of Coral Sea, which we started in the last scenario, or not scenario, but last video. And so far we've cleared uh, the Port Moresby Harbor of enemy surface vessels. We sank three heavy cruisers and four or five destroyers. Uh, our invasion fleet is moving in. We've spotted several enemy ships to the south, uh, but we have yet to actually spot the aircraft, although we have engaged some scouting aircraft and some dive bombers. We've yet to spot the actual carriers. Well, there you have it. Right as I start speaking, we spot an enemy carrier. So this is... Part 2 of our series looking at the Battle of Coral Sea. Uh, what am I at? Part 13 or 14 overall of my Let's Play of Order of Battle Pacific. Um, I expressed some concerns with the way that the branching scenario tree works, uh, or lack thereof in terms of a branching scenario last time around. Uh, but in this in this video, I'm not going to talk so much about that, just kind of uh, more in general. There were a few things I wanted to go over um, regarding the channel first of all and um, you know the first thing is that I, I know my Scourge of War Waterloo series video is already up and a lot of people seem to really enjoy that so I'm definitely going to be doing a let's play of the full nine hour scenario uh, which looks at the Battle of Waterloo from the French side uh, I want to make it a community let's play so I know some of you have asked questions about that basically what that means is at the end of each scenario I'll be looking for community advice on how we should proceed um, some people suggested kind of a basic poll of different strategies but I'd also like the ability for someone to write in a strategy um, that they think is unique I'd also like things to be a little bit more specific um, you know I don't want just attack on the left or attack on the right I'd like people to be able to say use um, you know, Jerome's infantry division to attack here or what have you. Certainly not required, but it would be a nice touch. Um, so I'll see how I'm going to do that exactly. My thoughts are to break it up into 30-minute segments, uh, which I'll probably go ahead and do, although maybe the first video will be an hour long because I think things will be a little bit slow. I've decided, based on the feedback from everybody, that the first episode will probably be looking at an attack on the uh, Papalot, I believe it's how it's pronounced, or no, Placenoa. Placenois. On the Allied right, I want to clear those buildings of some of the enemy troops there to try and drive a wedge between us and any oncoming Prussian forces. I don't think it's too gamey to say that we'd want to do that, uh, given the fact that uh, Napoleon knew that there was a risk that the Prussians would come, uh, although maybe by 11 a.m. he wasn't aware they were actually coming. Uh, he certainly was aware that Grouchy was out there, and he wasn't sure if Grouchy was uh, doing an adequate job of defending against it. Uh, or, you know, preventing the Prussians from coming. So we're going to do that. Uh, the first episode will be, like I said, an attack on Placenois uh, and also uh, perhaps an attack on the left as well, maybe try and sweep the uh, British out of the woods in front of the Hougamon, although certainly not launch an assault. So maybe a brigade-sized assault on the left while a division assault goes in on the right, uh, pulling a division of Elrond's corps uh, and moving it over to the right, perhaps. Uh, and then, you know, if the Allies weaken their flanks, we can launch Elrond and Relay straight up the middle uh, to make them pay for that. And if they don't, then uh, then we'll go from there, and we'll see what you guys want to do. In addition to that, um, I also wanted to say that I am going to be returning to my Commander of the Great War series here very shortly. I do have a video recorded of that series. Um, I just haven't done the audio yet, but I've got the actual gameplay. Uh, we'll see how much longer that series lasts, but I definitely will intend to return to that on a more normal schedule. Um, in addition to that, I'm also considering doing a kind of a historical game type episode uh, where maybe once a week, and this is... I say once a week as if I am regularly posting all the time and that once a week would mean something. Um, but uh, with a lot of different things, like I mentioned, a job offer that's uh, going to be a considerable commute. Um, some other items going on in my life right now um, as far as that's concerned certainly have prevented me from being able to be too regular in terms of my video uploads. Uh, although I would think for about a month here now that the summer semester is coming to an end, I'll have a little bit more time. Uh, to maybe be a little bit more regular. So I'd like to try and, you know, maybe put two or three videos up a week. That's ideal. And then maybe one of those videos, maybe like on Thursday, kind of like a throwback Thursday or whatever, uh, we would look at kind of an older game. I've got a few games I want to look at. Um, Sid Meier's Gettysburg, one of those classics that inspired a lot of games. Maybe Water 
Waterloo, Napoleon's last battle, um, or Waterloo, Austerlitz, uh, Napoleon's greatest victory, uh, Civil War Generals 2. Uh, a lot of games out there that I'd like to cover, um, but uh, not quite sure how to go about doing that. So maybe we'll do that uh, once a week if that's something you guys think is interesting. Um, and then just in general trying to get back into the flow of things. More Scourge of War, more Order of Battle Pacific, more Commander of the Great War. Um, I also am looking at possibly doing a play-by-email series uh, with Belugan, uh, although that's something that will probably be a little while in the making, um, where maybe we look at uh, like a gigantic uh, turn-based game um, to be named later. And then also um, a play-by-email game of making history uh, the Great War uh, is also something I'm looking at doing with Agrippa Maxenius and a few other people. So, a um, lot of stuff on the docket, not nearly enough time to do it all, we never have enough time. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at right now. Uh, you can see here our carrier force has detected the American carrier fleet. Our carriers are all, uh, minus their aircraft, they've all taken off and flown south. Uh, meanwhile, our escorts have closed a gun range and are engaging enemy surface vessels with their guns. So, uh, this battle certainly breaking course with the way that the actual Battle of the Coral Sea broke with. We had a large surface engagement between three heavy cruisers and four or five destroyers uh, in the bay near Port Moresby on the southeastern tip of New Guinea. And then uh, we've also now had some surface engagements with some uh, Allied destroyers, uh, the, the wide-out screen of the U.S. carrier fleet. So certainly not uh, the case of the actual Battle of Coral Sea where no ships came within gun range and engaged gun to gun. Um, but there you have it. We just detected the second American carrier. So we've now detected two American carriers. I assume that's all they have. Historically, the U.S. had deployed the USS Yorktown and the USS uh, Lexington to the Battle of Coral Sea. Lexington was sunk. Your town was badly damaged. Uh, that's what we've likely detected at this point, and we've got our carrier squadrons uh, into the air and uh, on their way toward the enemy. So we're 12 turns in. We've got 18 turns left to sink two American carrier fleets, or, or two American carriers, that is, uh, and per or perhaps just destroy their air units. Meanwhile, it looks like Port Moresby has launched some long-range heavy bombers out against us. You can see they're uh, bombing some of our vessels that were just in the victorious uh, engagement uh, in the Battle of Port Moresby. It's naval action. And uh, hopefully we've taken out or weakened enough of the Americans' uh, carrier aircraft to make this strike group heading south succeed there. Uh, I don't really have much in the way of escorts. Our fighters have all been forward deployed, engaging enemy scouting aircraft and fighter aircraft, trying to protect our scouts. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, you can see here the enemy cruisers are chasing around our scout planes with the goal of shooting them down. Uh, but that's leaving their carriers pretty exposed. There's nothing within range of the carrier in terms of air defense. And you can see that one is heading west. It's heading the opposite direction of where its uh, air defense cruisers are. Uh, and we know because of our destruction of the American battle fleet at, Por at Pearl Harbor that the Americans have no battleships. So uh, they've lost three heavy cruisers, two of them Australian, and uh, the uh, carrier fleet appears to have at least three more heavy cruisers capable of defending the carriers uh, that we are on our way to go and blow up. Uh, meanwhile, uh, again, uh, just sort of a, an FYI or a heads up, guys, I hope that uh, the audio quality is okay in this video. I am recording from a uh, location other than my apartment where I normally record, um, like I said last episode, uh, just something where I've uh, been recording elsewhere. Don't worry, everything's fine along those those uh, regards, just kind of house-sitting type stuff. Um, although by the time this video posts, I won't be anymore. Uh, it's just about today is our last day of doing it, but it's been a lot of fun. Um, it's been a enjoyable couple of days away from home, just kind of relaxing, almost like a little, little mini vacation. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's where we're at. And don't tell people when you house sit. That's one of the things people always say. Like I said, by the time this video posts, we'll be home, so it won't matter. Um... Lots of people get robbed that way. Anyway, that's off point. So, here we go. We're engaging these enemy aircraft, shooting them down, and uh, attempting to close in on the U.S. fleet. You can see here those three heavy cruisers, the enemy carrier over here that we've got our uh, uh, scout plane over, and where did the other U.S. carrier go? I know we've got at least one in our sights. I'm not quite sure where the other is, but we know the general vicinity. Um, those are probably destroyers. So we can move these surface vessels to the south now. 
uh, and maybe attempt to engage more of the enemy uh, enemy surface vessels down there. Um, so yeah, uh, be nice if Yamato was faster. I wonder how the hex range of the U.S. Iowa classes compare. I wonder if it's identical to uh, the Yamato or if it's something that's a little bit quicker because the U.S. carriers or U.S. battleships were known as kind of being fast battleships, uh, especially the later, newer battleships which were designed to keep up uh, with the U.S. carrier fleet uh, and ended up being glorified anti-air platforms for much of the war, that and bombardment platforms uh, for much of the war. But uh, you can see here we're almost using our zeros like scouts, uh, engaging enemy aircraft when we see them and uh, weakening them hopefully at every chance, but at the same time um, not, not really escorting our aircraft here. So we've got our strike group. We're going to start swinging it to the west to move over and engage the carrier which we spotted. And uh, we've got a good mix of dive bombers and torpedo bombers. Now one thing that's always important when it comes to Order of Battle Pacific, especially when it comes to configuring large carrier strikes, is the fact that, uh, as I, and I mentioned this in previous videos, torpedo bombers, uh, you can choose to outfit them with bombs, in which case they really are just dive bombers, they're just a little bit worse at it. But if you decide to use them the way they're designed with torpedoes, then what will happen is when you move in, you have to get really close to the target. You don't have to be directly overhead like with a dive bomber, but you can be like maybe one or two hexes away. And then you can go ahead and launch your torpedo. It does a lot more damage on bigger ships than small ships. Destroyers don't take as much damage from a torpedo. That's probably to simulate the fact that a fast-moving small destroyer is much harder to hit. Um, but essentially destroyers... Or, or sorry, torpedo bombers can drop a torpedo, but then after they do that, they can't drop anything for four more turns. So they might knock out three or four hit points of an enemy ship, but then they're basically just cannon fodder for three or four turns until um, you know you uh, until you wait those turns, and then they can launch an attack for one more turn. So one out of four turns, these torpedo bombers are just bait or just uh, you know really harm harmless. Uh, they can strafe things, but that's about it, and that doesn't do much in the way of damage. It normally does nothing at all. The dive bombers, on the other hand, do much less damage to big ships, do better damage to small ships, and they can attack every single turn. So when it comes to planning your air raids, a nice mix of both is ideal. You bring in the torpedo bombers, especially in that initial attack, you get a big initial hit, maybe knock out half or more of the enemy's hit points, and then those, uh, while your guys are reloading or waiting to, to get back in the action, the dive bombers come in and finish the target off. It's really critical to have torpedo bombers, because like I said, a dive bomber against a capital ship will really only have one uh, hit point against it. Maybe two if it's lucky, but really one. And a torpedo bomber could have, you know, two, three, I've seen it have four before. So uh, something that you want to, you know, keep, it, keep in mind is that, sure, a dive bomber might take ten turns to sink a ship, but if you mix it with a torpedo bomber, it can sink it much, much quicker. Um, by the time the torpedo bomber four turns later is ready to reload, the ship is either about to sink or that torpedo strike will sink it. Meanwhile, you can see here we're moving these fleets uh, to the south, uh, engaging the enemy where we can. I know it does risk us losing hit points. At the same time, one thing that I really want to do is try and build up my fleet's experience. Now that we're getting into Coral Sea, we're starting to get into later scenarios where the U.S. is going to be in less uh, disadvantaged positions than they start out in a lot of the early scenarios. At least that's my assumption, because that's what happened in reality. So my goal is to get these units up in my core with as much experience as possible so that they can be more effective as things become more difficult. So that's where I'm at right now. Um... It is worth mentioning, I haven't noticed too much of a combat impact when it comes to experience, so I'm kind of guessing at what, what experience does. I know it must do something, there'd be no point in having it just for no reason, but I'm not 100% sure what exactly it does do. Historically, the old Panzer General game would allow you to kind of have bigger units, so like an elite unit could have a, a max hit point of 11 or 12. I believe it also helped their combat effectiveness, but uh, essentially an 11 or 12, I'm not fully sure what those additional experience points do here in this game. But you can see here we're moving west now. We spotted the other U.S. carrier. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, the closer U.S. carrier seems to be missing here, uh, although there certainly are some cruisers. I'm going to guess it's, well, it's going to be somewhere near here. Um, I could launch torpedoes against this supply ship, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, they can go ahead and they can they can strafe them though and, and inflict some damage there that way. One of the rare times I've seen um, torpedo uh, bombers actually be useful. Uh, meanwhile, you can see the enemy does have some dauntless dive bombers, but nothing they've sent out 
really has gotten anywhere close to our fleet or our ships. The closest they've gotten to doing any kind of damage to our ships from the air has been a couple of land-based, well actually just one land-based bomber, uh, which headed to um, one of our light carriers, but really did almost no damage. So we're coming up on the halfway point in this scenario, and I'm getting the sense that hopefully uh, we don't need the full, the full 30 turns and we can win well in advance. Another one of those uh, random things that um, I wanted to bring up in a video, and I I don't know, I feel like sometimes these Let's Play videos turn into more random channel updates once through the second or third video in a given battle. And I think that makes some sense. You know, most of the suspense in this kind of a, a game is the last actual attack against the enemy, but it's also the initial finding the enemy. And when you're kind of coming to grips and closing... There's not a whole lot of interest to discuss in the first video. I already talked a lot about the actual Battle of Coral Sea, at least from a high-level overview. I never really got too specific. I'd like to get more specific, but, you know, the Pacific War just isn't... At least a lot of the Pacific War just isn't something that I honestly know a ton about. I should know more. Uh, I'm, after all, named the historical gamer, right? Um, but uh, it's just one of those things that I feel like I don't know enough about to feel too confident going into detail like you do with the Civil War. Um, and I, I should probably change that. But anyway, I'm rambling. One of the other things I wanted to bring up in this video was the fact that there's a new podcast. Well, it's not that new, I guess. They've been going for three, four months now. But uh, there's a podcast I just started listening to. I mentioned that I already listened uh, to Three Moves Ahead. I went through like a binge when I first really seriously started listening to them. I listened to like 200 episodes in a week. And then, you know, kind of caught up and listened to most of the rest. But uh, one of the things that bothered me is Three Moves Ahead is a very clearly a strategy gaming podcast, much less so war games specifically. And while my channel is dedicated to history, if you look at several of my videos have been more historical topics, uh, not a lot, certainly not recently, but like I know I've covered Out of the Park Baseball uh, from more of a historical context, and I'd like to do more of that as well. But um, one of the things that kind of bothers me a little bit about Three Moves Ahead is... Not anything wrong with this series, but it very specifically focuses on strategy games. And strategy games are not always war games. Um, there's a lot of strategy games I have no interest in. Uh, most real-time strategy games, I'd say like StarCraft or whatnot, I'm sure it's a great game. It's just never been something that appeals to me all that much. I guess it's a military simulator too, kind of sort of in kind of a sci-fi space kind of way, but it's just, it's never been something that's interested me, and I'm sure it's a great game, but that doesn't matter, because that's not what I'm interested in. Um, but as far as what I like to share and what I like to talk about, I think something that would fit a lot of what my viewers uh, listen to, and I'm sure a lot of them listen to Three Moves Ahead, and I'm sure a lot of them are very interested in, in uh, StarCraft and other games like that, but I think a genre podcast that, really the only other one that I've found... Um, that's done more than one or two episodes, uh, is relatively new, just started back in April, and uh, it's called The Grogcast, which is a podcast that uh, is done by the guys over at groghead.com, uh, grogheads.com, and it's a website that focuses mainly on military uh, war games. They do a little bit of other strategy games, but mainly military war games of either a computer or a board game variety. And uh, I've only listened to one and a half episodes so far, so um, take that for what it is. Uh, but at least what I've heard so far seems encouraging. Uh, granted, it's very early in what I've listened to. They've got like 15 episodes out now, so I'll let you know more once I find more out. But it's certainly something that I'd recommend you guys check out. It's called The Grogcast. Um, I'm sure you can find it. Uh, I don't know if it's on iTunes. Uh, I'm guessing it is on iTunes because they have it on... Um, a Android application. It's hosted and pointed from Podcast Podcast Addict, an Android, so I would assume if they have it there, they probably have it on iOS through iTunes as well. Uh, if not, you can listen to it over at grogheads.com. That's www.grogheads.com. And no, I'm not getting paid anything to talk about this. It's just something that I stumbled upon uh, thanks to Kushin, uh, who is starting to do his own YouTube and uh, streaming stuff on Twitch, uh, and he writes over at, uh, at uh, Grogheads on his uh, um, Distant Worlds Universe Let's Play AAR type thing. So if, uh, if a podcast sounds interesting to you that focuses a lot on war games and history and, and strategy, then uh, I recommend checking that out and seeing what you think. Again, um, 
I'll let you know more once I know more. But so far, it seems interesting. The guys, at the very least, uh, have a, a good radio voice. I guess one of them used to work in radio and uh, clearly seem to know what they're doing. So, And also give them a little bit of credit, too. To just that fact, just the ability to sound prepared and know what you're talking about, takes quite a bit of effort. Um, I want to, at some point, start my own podcast. Uh, I would definitely like to get into it, but... Uh, podcasts are hard. <laughs> Anything where you have to make regular content like that and have a discussion to talk about, you know, I'm, I'm kind of cheating. Uh, I've, I've kind of gone the lazy route in that I've done a lot of Let's Plays of recent, and Let's Plays, let's face it, they're easy. Especially if it's a, a topic I already know a lot about, so if it's a Let's Play for a Civil War game, I'm not trying to tell you that you shouldn't listen to my stuff, because I, I like it when you guys listen to me, but uh, I do think that they're really easy, especially when you know a topic really well. Something like this might be a little bit more difficult if it's a topic I don't know a ton about, because it definitely requires some research, but when you don't have any kind of visuals to go off of, you know, I can comment based on what I'm seeing here, based on my selection of this fighter aircraft and my decision to pull it back to uh, my carriers. You know, I can comment on that type of stuff uh, based on visual clues that I get while I'm playing. You don't get those kind of options in a podcast. You basically have to either know exactly what you're going to talk about or ad-lib on the fly. And regardless of how you do that, knowing and keeping a conversation flowing uh, and going is, is a very difficult job. And that's why you see most podcasters are not solo people shows. One of them is because who wants to listen to someone talk to their self all the time? Well, I guess a lot of you who listen to me. Um, take that back. Listen to people talk to themselves all the time. It's great. Seriously, I mean, I do it too, so whatever. But uh, anyway, this is a weird episode. Um, but uh, it takes a lot of skill, uh, I think, in my opinion, to, to formulate something like that. And again, it's something I want to get into. It's just one of those things where I haven't... I, I didn't want to start a podcast like I'd, I'd been talking about doing one with Belugan for a while. Um, but both of our schedules are so hectic right now. I didn't want to start a podcast where it was like, sure, we'll do one episode and then never do another one, or we'll do two or three or four, and then, you know, it just dies before it gets any kind of momentum. If, if I were to do a podcast uh, full-time, I would want to make sure that it's something that I can commit to and that it's not just going to die a real quick death due to, due to lack of commitment. And that takes a lot of work. I guess that's really my only point. I'm really good, um, if anything... Uh, I feel like I am extremely good at rambling about nothing for quite a while, so there, there, there's that. Um, but anyway, as we uh, kind of work through the scenario, you can see our ships have started, to, or our aircraft have started to close in on the enemy carrier fleet and uh, uh, dealing some significant damage there. Meanwhile, our attacking forces are suffering some attrition as well and have had to pull some of our fighter units back. Uh, again, I want to try and get as much experience as possible, so as long as it's not a situation where attacking an enemy unit causes me four or five losses for only two uh, enemy killed, then I definitely want to make sure that I'm attacking pretty much everywhere. I've kind of determined that the victory prestige or points or currency or whatever that I'm getting uh, when I win battles is more than enough to replace the units that are suffering damage uh, and most of the units that I've lost. Now, that's not ideal for recruiting new units or new carriers or other things like that, uh, but at the very least I can replace my losses with elite replacements and uh, maintain my experience, so it's something that I want to make sure that I'm uh, not cheating the opportunity to get experience because uh, essentially once you gain experience as long as you do an elite replacement you don't lose a dime i i heard some reports actually speaking of podcasts from the three moves ahead group which didn't seemingly like order of battle pacific despite the fact that i absolutely adore it for the most part um and uh, they kind of imply that you lose a little bit of experience if you do elite replacements. And I, I did the math, or I watched the screen. I, uh, I did a replacement, and I looked at my experience, and it didn't change at all. So as long as you can afford to do those re elite replacements, it really uh, pays dividends, I think. Um, again, I'm not clear on exactly uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of benefits uh, the experience has, but I feel like it should be good, and I want more experienced units, and it certainly is something that's relevant to the Pacific War. I know I mentioned in the last video the kind of the meat grinder campaign that existed around the Solomon Islands and how the Japanese Air Force was just kind of chewed up there where their experienced pilots went there and over a 9, 10, 11 month campaign, uh, they went in with absolute crack units and crack pilots and high quality equipment to slowly be worn down by the U.S. forces. 
until that experience level was much reduced. And I hypothesized that uh, that campaign more so than um, than the Battle of Midway was critical in reducing the effectiveness of Japanese uh, air and naval arms because a large degree of those forces that were flying off those islands were not just a not just army pilots, they were also navy pilots. Um, so I did hypothesize there that uh, that, that uh, campaign helped to trit their experience. So I feel at least as playing as Japan, um, if only to simulate history, perhaps, I should make sure that I am uh, doing everything I can to keep experienced units high uh, and maybe spending more on replacements doing that, even if there's not a huge benefit, uh, is just me handicapping myself to history, I suppose. Maybe I'm just rationalizing being stupid. I don't know. But uh, I feel like experience should matter, and uh, it's hard to tell. The game has a little bit of mystery in it sometimes, uh, being able to tell uh, what does what. But uh, I like the idea anyway. Uh, by the way, if you're annoyed by the Japanese portrait guy in the top right, he is a army commander, so I cannot assign him to an air unit. And seeing as we have no army units under our command, uh, that's why he's been up there the entire battle so far, and he's going to stay there. So we sank one American carrier. We've got one American carrier left. Uh, and that's what our next target is. Again, we've had to pull some troops out, uh, some units out due to uh, losses. Uh, but uh, now we are uh, on the verge of finishing the enemy off almost 10 turns in advance. So uh, there's, there's that aspect, which is obviously going well. You can see the Americans are pulling some of their forces back to the carrier, perhaps to rearm and upgrade. Uh, they just pulled a fighter unit, which had been pretty heavily decimated, back to the carrier. And uh, we're moving into turn 18 so far, with things going pretty much our way. The Battle of uh, Port Moresby itself uh, was a success. We destroyed the entire enemy fleet in the bay. We've now destroyed one of two American carriers, so at least in terms of the carrier conflict, uh, we've uh, pulled even with history here, as we're now having to deal with this line of cruisers and their anti-aircraft fire. Um, and you can see here the invasion fleet is closing in on Port Moresby, uh, getting extremely close to the port, uh, and I would expect them to take that uh, next turn, assuming the computer does land those troops. Meanwhile, these uh, torpedo bombers are also heavily damaged, so we're going to have to pull them back to the carrier, hopefully get them some experience. Uh, we got some zeros here now that have just re replenished themselves, we'll go ahead and get those back to the main body, and we'll uh, land these zeros and get them uh, rested and replenished up. I'm hoping I can win this battle in the next two turns, I think that's reasonable. Uh, we still have three uh, bombing groups at least. You can see that torpedo bomber is now ready to drop a torpedo again. It's been four turns, so they launch their torpedo there against the carrier, uh, and they lose almost 50%. Uh, meanwhile, the second torpedo bomber closes in, but still has one more cooldown turn before it can do anything, and then our dive bombers can't quite make it to the carrier. Uh, meanwhile, pulling out some more zeros because of casualties, and then uh, this zero, I guess we could go and have him strafe the enemy, but that seems pointless, so we'll just have him protect us in case the enemy decides to launch its fighter aircraft from uh, that carrier here next turn. Um, hopefully we can provide some escort support, and uh, we've got some dive bombers as well, which will move in. Also, one reason I am moving my carriers to the south continually is to avoid this situation right here where this bomber has to turn back because it's low on fuel. That's what that... Uh, little red hexes mean as those units are low on fuel. Essentially, if you fly toward those hexes or if you fly anywhere where it is a red hex, uh, then the next turn or, or going through the next couple of turns, your carry, your plane won't have enough fuel to get back to uh, where it needs to get, to get back to in order to resupply and refuel, and it will crash before it's able to get to a friendly runway. Just keep, just keep in mind those areas can change. You know, if you move your carrier further toward your aircraft, then something that might have been out of range previously will be in range uh, next time. Or um, something that maybe was in range to get back to in time if your carrier is sailing the wrong direction uh, will be unreachable by the time you actually are, are there and need to land before you crash. So keep that in mind. Although I will say that given the fact that uh, units tend to have 13 turns or so worth of fuel, uh, it doesn't seem so far that fuel plays a huge role in these scenarios. Perhaps the fuel uh, capacity should be reduced a little bit, and that would also help prevent this kind of annoying feeling of just a dive bomber almost just kind of slowly pecking the enemy to death uh, as it's kind of like doing one damage a turn, which, you know, again, is not very um, accurate uh, with uh, the idea of a unit inflicting one bomb per turn. Well, if it dropped its bomb, it should probably go back to the carrier and get new bombs. Um, but anyway, you can see here, 
Oh, wow, sorry, my voice just gave out. Uh, you can see her computer forces have captured the island, or not the island, but the city of Port Moresby. Uh, so New Guinea is now largely in our control. Uh, at this point, we have definitely exceeded what happened historically. Despite that capture, the airfield's not yet operational. We can't deploy our long-range bombers from there. So we'll have to uh, put that off for now. And uh, while these guys are really low on fuel, they can launch one more torpedo attack. Uh, these dive bombers, uh, or torpedo bombers, can also launch another attack, although they're out of their ammo and will be for four more turns. Um, and our dive bombers need to return immediately or they will crash. I'm going to gamble that if I win the scenario before the planes crash, that, uh, that they don't crash, and, and that's kind of gaming it. But that is kind of what I'm going to do here. As you can see, we have crushed the second American carrier. So the American carrier fleet is totally destroyed. Both carriers here are destroyed. Port Moresby has fallen. The American surface fleet near Port Moresby has been destroyed. A couple of American cruisers are left, as well as some destroyers. But the carriers they were tasked with to protect are destroyed. And uh, that's going to be it, folks. We're going to win this battle uh, pretty decisively, much more decisively than was historically the case. Uh, so we should be going into the Battle of Midway with an advantage. Also, that special event does tell us that there's going to be a carryover result, and it was also a secondary objective, so those do have carryover results. So my guess is the Battle of Midway, instead of the U.S. having the historical three carriers, the Yorktown Enterprise, and uh, what was the third one? Was it Saratoga? Um, instead of those three carriers, the U.S. will probably just have two, the Enterprise and Saratoga, or I think it was Saratoga. Maybe it was Hornet or Wasp. I'm not sure. But uh, they'll essentially only have two carriers to deal with us, which should make that scenario a lot more doable if we've got four carriers versus their two instead of four versus their three. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, uh, folks, that is going to just about do it for this scenario. We'll go ahead and we'll end the turn in just a moment here, and we'll, uh, we'll see that we've won the battle. Uh, you can see here we've got low fuel, but it doesn't matter. Victory. Port Moresby has been taken, and a significant blow dealt to the enemy. Uh, carrier groups uh, that eluded us at Pearl Harbor, so kind of Pearl Harbor completed. Uh, there you go. Next scenario is Midway. Um, so history is sort of still following itself, although the fact that we destroyed that additional U.S. carrier will play, uh, pay significant dividends for this uh, battle. Meanwhile, folks, uh, that's going to do it for me today. Uh, until next time, I hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, the next video we'll be doing, we'll be looking at the Battle of Midway in that scenario, and uh, also some Scourge of War here before too long. But again, I appreciate you tuning in, and until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.